I'm very excited to be part of this webinar series and uh, very happy to be the first speaker. So I have a lot of responsibility, I guess. So in the next uh, half an hour or so, I'm going to discuss about uh, how to try to autonomously design battery materials and interfaces using density functional theory. So if you look at the development of batteries in the last uh, 200 years, this is what you can see. So the first uh, to say that the, the, to use the term battery was Benjamin Franklin in the middle of the 1700th century and was uh, the 1800th Alexand Alessandro Volta made the first electrochemical cell. And actually, after that, uh, we have a, a continuous development of different battery materials and different kind of uh, even device up to what we have now with the lithium ion batteries and beyond lithium ion batteries. If you look at the, the lithium ion, this is more or less what happened. The, there's a short uh, uh, history. So it was in 1980 that uh, John Goodenough invented the first cathode for lithium ion battery. And uh, it was commercialized in the beginning of, uh, of the 90s by Sony. And it got basically mass produced uh, only 20 years later after uh, the, um, the, the, the first invention, so in around 2000. So it took about 20 years to develop the new battery materials and battery devices. Of course, this is not, uh, is not uh, something we can sustain anymore. I mean, as Alejandro showed before, uh, we need to have uh, to speed up the, to accelerate the discover new battery materials or new materials in general. So how can we do that? And uh, more or less what happened up to now is that the development of new batteries follows an design uh, process. So where we develop first uh, uh, materials, then we try the synthesis, then we characterize, we go for a cell level and the pack level. And all of these, they just have a like, feedback uh, back and forth, but uh, we go for step by step. This is something we would like uh, to, to accelerate. And uh, how do we do that? So what I'm gonna show you is uh, on two different levels. One of the materials level, and this I will take an example, the development of new intercalation electrodes for magnesium ion batteries. And the second is the interface. So the, basically what happens at the, S, at the lithium ion interface and the, and the anode material. So then of course there is component and cell, some that Alejandro showed before and other speakers should, we should do in the week, but I will focus only at the angstrom and nanometer level. So going back to the to different uh, time and length scale involved, we have that the battery is a very complex device that goes from the atomic scale to up to the um, nanometer or millimeter scale, right? So with the cell and so on. So we cannot have a we don't have a unified model to des to to design a full battery. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is all made in the uh, frame of, of uh, quantum mechanics and in particular density functional theory. So this covers nanometer and picometer scale in terms of uh, length and time scale. And what we can model is around up to 500 atoms. So this, of course, will improve in the next years with the improvement of, uh, of computational power. But up to now, around the 500 atoms is, is the limit that we can, uh, we can achieve. So going to the first point, so basically, how do we design a new materials? Um, Many of you probably already heard about uh, what is a high throughput screening approach. I'm going to uh, summarize it here. So the conventional approach or the descriptive model goes from materials to calculated properties. And this is sort of a direct design. Then you calculate the properties of a given structure and then you can look at what kind of uh, applications or experiments uh, you can do to, uh, you can use this material for. What have been developed in the last 30 years instead is a more a predictive model or inverse design. So now we, are, we want to answer the question, which kind of materials have the property that we would like to have, from, uh, that we like to, to have in, in our device? And then we go from uh, experiments or application to properties, and then we try to design the material that, the proper, with the, that has these properties. So we go from uh, uh, left to right to right to left. So from descriptive model to predictive model. And this usually is done using a, a final approach uh, shown here. So I will guide you through the, the different steps. First of all, we have to define the chemical space that we want to investigate. This could be taking materials from known databases like ICSD, Materials Project Database, but also using a structure prototype approach. So you take a, a crystal structure and then you decide to decorate the different positions with different chemical elements. For example, we can take a sodium chloride type of structure and then replace all the plus one elements for sodium and all the uh, halide elements instead of chlorine and so on. 
Then we can uh, look at the elemental properties. So which kind of elements we would like to have uh, in our pool of, uh, of possible kind of materials. And then we can remove uh, elements that are non-abundant or that are harmful and toxic, uh, that, have, uh, that are high cost and so on. We can use a chemical intuition. So look at uh, use uh, chemical rules to remove some of the materials that for sure will not uh, behave as we would like to. We can use data mining to, to sort of do what nature has been done so far to reduce the number of materials. So for example, we can take a, a database and look at the, all the substitution from lithium to sodium, give some kind of properties, and then we apply the same in our system as well. And then is when we start the real doing calculations, and then we can calculate the stability of a material. Here it can be done, for example, using a convex hole, so to estimate the stability against phase separation, but also we can estimate the stability in a, in a real electrochemical environment, for example, using Courbet diagrams. Beyond that, we can look at electronic properties, we can calculate band gaps, that could be a, a descriptor for a for efficiency in the solar cell. We can calculate effective masses, that is a descriptor for the mobility of the charges. We can calculate defect chemistry, so to, that is a descriptor for a defect tolerance and so on. And then beyond this, we go for interface properties. This is uh, increasing even further the complexity. We can look at uh, how the bands align, or what is the solid-solid or solid electrolyte interface. And these are very relevant for batteries or catalysts in general. The, the, the point behind this is that going from the elemental properties to the interfacial properties, the complexity is increasing, and so the computational cost. So at each one of these steps, you have to ditch the materials or the potential materials that do not fulfill the properties you would like to have. In order to get to a, to a handful of materials that you can go to a, to a lab and try to make the synthesis, or uh, you, can, uh, you can ask somebody to do that for you. More for in, in relation with battery materials, this is another kind of uh, funnel approach. You have ele elemental properties, could be something that gives you high specific energy, low uh, cost and low uh, CO2 footprint, non-toxin, non-harmful. It could be abundant um, uh, elements and so on. We would like, uh, um, we can look at stability and transport properties. So uh, for example, what is the electrolyte degradation, uh, diffusion pathways, the dimensionality of material. We can go for the interface. And this uh, is something that uh, we have a, a new European project called BigMap um, that is, uh, is focused on materials, uh, uh, accelerated materials interfaces. Uh, we can look at the solid liquid and solid electrolyte interface. Um, what is the SEI that I'm going to talk about uh, later on. And then beyond the interface, we can look at uh, multi-scale properties. So what uh, Alejandro showed uh, before. And then at the end, we have new materials and we have uh, uh, new components and new, new design for structures, and so, for, for batteries and so on. And again, also in this case, we go for increasing complexity each one of these steps. So what I'm going to show you in the, in the next slides is actually mostly on the uh, bulk properties and interface properties. So in a, a short how-to for high throughput, uh, here I'm going to show you uh, density functional theory calculations, but uh, you can also use other kinds of, uh, of methods. You need to find a way to search rapidly through an a large data set. Possibly this should be done automatically. It's a compromise between high speed and good accuracy. We cannot... Uh, produce a super high accurate calculations because the, 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 the calculations will be too expensive. But at the same time, we don't want to have a very bad setups or very bad calculations because we'll not be representative of our systems. We need to have a, a large but manageable number of calculations. Typically, we want a structure that has 20, 30 atoms in a unit cell in order to have a, a good number of calculations in a, in a decent, number of in this decent amount of time. And then we need to identify the descriptors that are easy to calculate quantities, but they can significantly target the property that we would like to have. And then we remember to increase this, the complexity step by step, and in each one of these steps, you reduce the number of candidates. Uh, you need to select a good chemical space. So uh, look at the electronic properties, first of all, because it's, a, it's something that counts for free. So you don't have to run any calculation, and this will accelerate your, your material discovery. And then if you can, use uh, your chemical intuition to remove unsuccessful combinations. As well. And at the end, you have a, a full handful of materials to, to suggest for more general studies, for example, more in-depth study from the theory or from experimental synthesis. There are a few papers. Here is one example where uh, they show examples of descriptors. And I would like just to advertise one of our e-learning course, course here at DTU 
that is uh, is open so everybody can take it and is e-learning uh, is on uh, uh, autonomous uh, discovery of uh, of materials so it's uh, targeting basically what some of the things that I'm I'm going to show later so the first point was to find the new materials for intercalation electrodes and here I take the case of uh, find new cathode materials for magnesium ion batteries uh, why magnesium ion because it's a multivalent battery, so we could we can expect a, a larger, a higher capacity compared to lithium-ion batteries, um, and uh, its magnesium is more abundant than some of the of the, of the elements needed in, in lithium-ion. There are different challenges. One is uh, having unstable electrolytes, but also the fact that we have poor cathode materials, so we have a low open circuit voltage and a low charge discharge rate. The state of the art for this kind of battery is the so-called Schiedel phase. So magnesium molybdenum oxide that has a, a open circuit voltage of around 1.1 and this is significantly less compared what we have with lithium battery so what we wanted to do here was to try to design a workflow to make the discovery of this kind of uh, intercalation electrodes uh, autom autonomous and, and actually accelerated and this is what we have done here uh, in this case is one of the first workflow where you combine thermodynamic and kinetic properties all together so just in briefly what we have is that we if you, you can see the, the, the snap here, we optimize the cell, we calculate the stability, then we prepare uh, the, some structure with defects to, to look at the open circuit voltage and also the mobility of the, of the ions. So it, we have three different decision marks. One is stability, open circuit voltage, and diffusivity. And at the end, if this one, they perform better than the, the Chevrolet phase, then we consider a good, cathode, good candidate material for experimental synthesis. Here, as an input parameters or input structure, we take uh, all the structure from the uh, from known databases, so the ICSD and materials project, but we could also look at unknown materials. So for example, what I said before, using a structured prototype approach. And this is uh, the, the workflow more in the details. The only input that is required from the user is actually the structure. So once the user gives the structure and some of the parameters to run the calculations, this could be which ion you want to diffuse, what is the, the diffusion path, and the, the threshold for the potential for the decision of the open circuit voltage, then the, the workflow proceeds automatically. And then you create it creates the different structures needed from the calculations, calculate the at the property itself and then as an output you have a key parameters for example what is the volume change what is the the stability what is the, the stability both in the charge and the discharge state you can look at the open circuit voltage at the high and low state of charge and the same for the diffusivity so this is all autonomous uh, is uh, implemented in uh, in ASC and using MyQ that are two of the tools that we have uh, uh, here at DT, that we develop here at DTU and for the calculation engine we use VASP. I would like to point out that the workflow like this is actually is implemented for for VASP, but uh, it will be easier to change the calculator and use any other um, DFT codes, the one that you prefer. So the, most of the engine is actually running using ASC and and MyQ. So these are the, the structure that we need to give to the, the, the system calculate itself. You start, uh, this, uh, the input structure is the only one that uh, you as a user will pass to the system. And then you calculate the, the structure with where you have remove, uh, so the charge state where you have remove all magnesium, but also the one with the, uh, the discharge state with the, all the magnesium in the unit cell. And this gives you an idea of what is the stability. Then you can create a super cell and you can uh, get the, the the open circuit voltage, so the high and low state of charge, and then furthermore, and up to here actually we have only thermodynamic property, and then we include the kinetics. So where we actually have also diffusivity, and for this we use the nudge elastic method, we use an accelerated version that I'm gonna show you uh, soon. And this again is done all autonomously, and both at the high and low state of charge. So usually the nudge elastic band method is uh, something that is used to find a saddle point and minimum energy path between reactants and products is uh, actually a very expensive method because you need to calculate many images. So you find you start giving the initial line is the dash line here between R, uh, P, sorry, R and P and then the calculations will, uh, will find what is the, the, the most, uh, uh, the lowest energy path. So the one, the curve one here. And for doing that, you have to move all these points through the, this, uh, these lines, and that will, will take several, several iterations. 
Um, so what we want to do is try to find a method to accelerate this. And this can be done in two, two different ways. Uh, one is uh, using uh, symmetries to reduce the number of images to calculate. And another one could be using artificial intelligence. So I'm not going to show uh, you the methods using AI. I'm going to focus on uh, how to use the symmetries to do that. So if your path is symmetric, you can see here. So in a conventional lab, you have to calculate these seven images that are the one uh, in, in gray here. But if the path is symmetric, now you just can use this uh, so-called reflective nab where you just calculate half of the path because you know that the other half will be exactly the same because of the symmetry reason. So in this case, you have a roughly a speed up of two. But then you can go further and then you can also say that you use only the middle image. So if you know that you have a high symmetry, then you can expect that all the, the subtle point will be at the, in, the, in the middle. And then you, you need only two images to calculate, the initial and the, the middle. This gives you sort of a, a, an idea of what is the barrier. In many cases, the barriers for this kind of, uh, of structures, they show this like a, a bell shape. So for that, you could use a climbing image uh, RNAB, so reflective NAB, where you calculate, you, you try to find what is the, the real uh, saddle point. But then you need to do, if, you, if it's symmetric, you need to do only on half the cell and not the full one. So you, you have a speed up at least of a factor two. In many cases, you can, if you just need an estimate of the voltage, you just need the two, the two points. So it's, a, it's only two calculations. Um, so the, the workflow that we have here is taking care of different, these different possibilities. So you look at the symmetries. If there are symmetries, you go for reflection symmetry. You can try to do the RNAB. Uh, RMI neb, um, and then uh, instead, if there is no symmetry, then you go for a conventional uh, neb calculation. You can look at the barriers. There is a, above the diffusivity threshold. If it's uh, above that, you go. You are done because this will not be a new a new kind of material. If instead is not, then you can do a climbing image R neb. So to find the global minimum. So what is the peak here of the of the bell shape uh, diffusion path? And this is actually a significant improvement compared to what we have done, what you have in the conventional and uh, significant improvements in terms of speed, of, of course. Another point is actually how to deal with errors. So if we have an autonomous workflow, you would like also to be able to, uh, to, to deal with some of the most standard errors by itself without any of your, of your input. This is uh, the work, the way we implemented here for ESC is inspired by Custodian and basically takes care of uh, some of the most common errors in, uh, um, uh, in, in VASP for, for this kind of calculations. You can, uh, if you read the paper that we have recently published in Battery and Supercaps, you can see how, how this is dealt and where you can find the different uh, scripts for, uh, for using the workflow. And then if we go on, on the result side, we have uh, around 100 materials from the ICSD database that contains magnesium. We look first at the, here is just a, a, some preliminary results. We have six different structures. One is the Chevrel phase that again is used as our benchmark and uh, the materials that we would like to improve. Then we can look at, uh, so first of all, we look at stability and the change in the volume. We would like something that has a, vo uh, low, a small volume change and with a good stability. Uh, and then for the more, more, we can look at the open circuit voltage and what are their reaction barriers. So out of these six materials, one of the most promising one, it could be this magnesium vanadate oxide that is currently under investigation in, uh, uh, by one of our experimental partners. Beyond magnesium, we can, we can use the same uh, workflow also for calcium and batteries. Uh, calcium is an abundant material, again, is multivalent and has better red, uh, redox potential. If you look at the, in the ICSD, you have around 250 uh, materials that you could uh, study. There are, some of those are, are listed here. And you can see that some of them, they have uh, a good stability. Some other, they are less, less stable. Uh, you, can plot, uh, you can have plots like this, where you look at the chromatic capacity as a function of the average potential. And then you can try to identify which materials have the, a good capacity at the small volume change, and at the same time achieve a, a good potential. Uh, this is again only preliminary results. We have a, a student working on this now, uh, so stay tuned. We can, of course, uh, as Alejandro showed before, use uh, combine this workflow with uh, uh, artificial intelligence and try to, to accelerate even further the possible the, the development of discovery of these materials. 
uh, if you look at the full IC, the most common database, you can have uh, several thousands of different materials. So even with the, an autonomous way to do to run the calculation, they will be will not be feasible. So what we are doing now is uh, taking the database that we have developed for magnesium electrodes and try to apply some different kind of flavor of machine learning. One can be Ga Gaussian processing uh, to try to find the to, to predict the properties of materials without running the calculations. And that will, uh, will of course, uh, you know, accelerate even further the, the, the discovery. But not only, you, we can imagine that you can use the knowledge that you develop for, for example, for new cathodes for magnesium ion and transfer that for calcium. So where we are just to add some few training points and try to estimate the properties of calcium ion cathodes uh, without having to rerun the full, uh, the full training set. Then, after, so up to now, I, I talk about uh, the material. Now let me shift the uh, uh, topic and I go to the interface. So if you look at the, one of the most common and least understood interface in batteries, the one that's so-called uh, solid lithium, solid electrolyte interface. And this is uh, on, uh, on lithium ion batteries. Um, this has been seen for the first time on and in the 70s, so where people have seen a passivating layer on top of lithium. And uh, up to now is, People have been studying and try to, to understand how to practically uh, work on the material on the, on the electrolyte to control the formation of the SCI layer. But what is the SCI? The SCI is a passivating film that is formed on the anode uh, electrode, so typically on, on graphite, and it's something that is formed already from the first cycles of a, of a battery, but goes on for all the, uh, the formation and the degradation goes on for all the life of a battery. So we go from the initial nucleation to something, to a layer that gets uh, thickened to actually a point where we have a decomposition of the, of the SCI and the degradation, so that when the battery will stop working. If we look at the, at the atomistic level, we have something uh, that is, uh, is very complex, so it's a, it's a porous uh, layer, form of different species from lithium fluoride to lithium oxide, we have some inorganic compounds, carbonates, and so on. So it's it's actually an interface that is extremely difficult to model uh, because of the different length scale but and time scale where that that covers. So what I'm going to show is actually only related to the, the initial steps of the SCI formation and at the atomistic level. And the goal is that if we can understand the formation of the SCI, we are also able to produce better batteries, something that is safer, that something that has better charge and discharge time, uh, something that has longer lifetime. So our approach is actually to combine ideal experiments with realistic modeling. And let me explain what we mean with the ideal experiments and realistic modeling. So we try to take to make the experiments as clean as possible. So we like to avoid impurities. We would like to take well-determined surfaces, so in something that has no defects, no step, no edges. And for that, we decide to start at least the beginning with the uh, single crystal metals, because those are, are something that has been, they are used conventionally in catalysis, and they are, they can be made extremely pure. For the electrolyte, this has been purified to contain only selected impurities, so something that we can actually control. And for the modeling, we want to use uh, molecular dynamic simulations to produce the, to reproduce the structure of the electrolyte, but each of the MD step is calculated at the density functional theory level. And that allows us to correctly evaluate the energetics and electronic properties of the, of the, of the, of the structure that we are looking at. Uh, these calculations have been performed again using ASC, so the atomistic simulation environment, but as a DFT engine, we use a GPO that is a in-house code for the functional theory calculations. Um, so let me start with some of the experiments. Our experimental partners, uh, that is the group of Nenad Markovic and Argon, they, they took LP57, it is one of the conventional electrolytes for lithium ion batteries, and uh, with the well-determined concentration of uh, HF as uh, the all impurities in the, in the electrolyte. And then they could see that with time, the HF uh, concentration was reducing, and uh, on the other side, uh, sorry, the, um, the HF concentration was increasing and the water concentration was reducing. And this was because of the, uh, the impurity we had was water and interact with the salt forming HF and, uh, and the kind of phosphate. Uh, looking at the AFM and XPS, we could, they could see some a passivating film, and the uh, XPS analysis showed that uh, most of this film was actually a form of uh, lithium fluoride. 
doing some electrochemical uh, uh, cyclic voltammeter uh, experiments on different uh, single crystal metals, so iridium, platinum, gold, and copper, they saw that there was a shift uh, between the peaks. And then uh, uh, what we wanted to do together was to try to understand where the, these shifts come from. Why do we have this uh, uh, shifting when, uh, so it's something that happens at the surface, right? And then we look at the possible descriptor that can, uh, can, be, can describe this phenomena. And among all the possible uh, descriptors taken from adsorption of the species that are involved in this process, so hydrogen, lithium, fluoride, lithium fluoride, and the HF, um, the only one that actually seems to, to correlate with the electrochemical response is the uh, lithium, the adsorption energy of lithium. In the same way, the only one, uh, the other descriptor was the Wolf function. So it seemed that the Wolf function somehow correlated with the, with the electrochemical response. And uh, these two uh, terms tell us that the presence of lithium at the interface probably plays a kind of role in the, in the formation of lithium fluoride. So then, uh, um, you, you know, you can see that more in the details here, uh, more like zoomed. So what is the point? Why do, why, why uh, how can we, can we uh, understand the, the, why lithium is, is important? And for that, we use uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulations and DFT. So we use the so-called ab initio MD. And we look at the phase diagram of LP57 with different concentrations of lithium ion. So we have uh, different structures of the simulation. Lithium is here in purple. Uh, the one here is, uh, is the electrolyte. And here we, we have gold. And you can look at lithium in different positions. So where it's on the interface, in the electrolyte, two lithiums in, in different positions, and the presence of salt. And then uh, we can also add additives and see how, what is the effect of the additives uh, for the phase diagram of lithium. So then we can have a plot like this, where we have that uh, high potential, we have no lithium presence at the interface. And the concentration of lithium or the, the coverage of lithium at the interface is increasing going towards uh, the lithium lithium plus reference scale. This situation is very different from water where different you can just reach different potential by simply switching the, um, or rotating the water molecule. So a dipole correction, the, the dipole has a di direct effect in the, in, the, um, in the potential. In this case, it's not the case. So for lithium, the only way to go for different potentials is to change the, the coverage of lithium. Um, and then if we look at the lithium adsorption potential, so the point here where we start having lithium adsorbed at the surface, we see that also in this case, it correlates really well with the electrochemical response here. So the presence of lithium, this is a, clear, a further indication that the presence of lithium at the interface is required to, to split HF. Then we, we ditch for a bit the, the MD simulations and we take a structure of the electrolyte at the potential where we have lithium, uh, where we have lithium at the interface. So the, indicated by the red arrow here. And we try, we try two different things. One is uh, splitting HF without any lithium. And the second case we split HF with the presence of lithium. Right? And we take the structure of the electrolyte at 2.1 volt, that is this point here, and uh, the potential should be kept constant during the reaction. So otherwise we are comparing two different things. And then we can plot the reaction path like this. So we have in the, in the upper path, we have that uh, you, you have HF gets on, the, gets on the surface, split, and then eventually will form lithium fluoride. And the splitting of HF just by itself, it takes uh, around 0 0.9 electron volt. This is done on gold, but other metals, as, as I will show later, they, they behave in the same way. The second path instead, so the HF adsorbs on top of lithium, and then we split. So hydrogen will, uh, will move on. And this actually is downhill in energy of around 0 0.2 electron volt. So we show a, pos a possible mechanism where we have HF that is, uh, when lithium is at the surface, HF adsorbs on top of lithium, then hydrogen will, uh, will somehow separate from this compound, try and find another hydrogen that is on the surface and uh, evolve the hydrogen molecule. And uh, what is left is, is just the lithium fluoride. This is done for, when we do this for the four different metals that we study, we can see that this is, uh, is the case for all of them. So the only way to split HF is actually with the presence of lithium. So the lithium in this case works as a catalyzer for the reaction. Um, if we look at the full, so up to now, we have not considered the, 
the hydrogen evolution potential, so the, what is the propensity of each surface to evolve uh, hydrogen. If we also take that into account, and that is done here in the point uh, in the picture uh, four, in inset four, you can see that there is a real nice, a really nice correlation between the computational uh, with this kind of descriptor compared to the the the, um, the, lin the response, the electrochemical response. Um, the point three and point four, so the lithium absorption potential and the computational hydrogen evolution uh, reaction potential, they are not, they cannot really be called descriptors, because uh, for a descriptor to be a descriptor needs to be something that we want to, we can calculate really fast. In these two cases, is something that we need uh, ab initio and decalculations that usually takes several months of work. So we will, uh, this is something that we can do only for selected, uh, selected uh, structures or select, uh, selected uh, electrons. We can also try different kind of, uh, of um, electrolytes. So instead of using lithium PF6, we use, or salt, sorry, we use a sodium PF6, and we can see that there is just a, a small shift. And this is, uh, it's been seen both by experiments, but also by our calculations. So basically the, the only effect of uh, sodium instead of lithium is to shift the, the, the position where we start having the reaction. Beyond the HF impurity, we can uh, also add uh, water impurities. So now we manually add uh, water to the electrolyte, and we try to see what, what is the product there. Again, we have hydrogen evolution, but uh, how do we split water? And then you can see this in this, uh, in, in this slide here. We have several different paths. In one path, you split water into OH and hydrogen without any interaction with lithium, and this is a pill of around 1.6. Furthermore, we can have uh, uh, the presence of one lithium at the interfaces. So similar to what have been, we have seen for, uh, uh, for HF, where now water comes and absorbs on, the, on a lithium and then hydrogen will dissolve. And the absorption of, uh, of water on lithium is downhill, but then the second part, the, the splitting of, uh, uh, of removal of uh, one hydrogen is again up in energy. If we instead take a path where we have uh, two water, two lithium molecules, or two lithium ions, water that absorbs on top of it in a bridge position, and then hydrogen separates. This is downhill in energy of around 0 0.2. But in this case, we need the presence of two lithium at the interface. So this explains the position here. Why the water, in this case is the, the blue curve here, happens at an even further down uh, potential compared to HF that is in green. It's because we need a higher coverage of, uh, uh, of lithium on the surface. And that corresponds to have a lower potential, as you can see here in, the, in this point here. So the, the, cover, the, the potential where we start having two lithiums at the surface is the yellow here. So it happens at around half a volt lower than what happens for lithium. And this you can see both for water and uh, for gold and platinum. Now let's take that you, you add protons. Protons, now yeah, they're already dissociated. So to evolve hydrogen, you just need to look at the HER potential, so the standard hydrogen evolution potential. In this case, we are, this, uh, this potential correspond more or less to what you can see if you do in water, so in the, in the red line here. So then uh, you, you start evolving hydrogen, more or less the same potential as you were in a, in a water electrolyte. <coughs> we can also go beyond. Uh, so of course, this is done on, on gold and uh, platinum and other single crystal metals. That is <coughs> not the, the real ionic materials, but uh, it allows us to give a good uh, insight in what is the process because uh, we are removing all, imp all impurities. Then we like to be go beyond the uh, single metals and look at uh, more conventional anodes, for example, graphene and graphite. And you can see that uh, what on, on gold was happening really fast, so the, the reaction was really fast, on graphite is a little bit more scattered and then creates larger cracks. Uh, and this could be explained in different ways. One of them, and this is something that we are working on now, is uh, looking at the, at the war function. So the war function correlates really well with the absorption potential of lithium. So with the presence of lithium at the interface. If you have a lower work function, that means that lithium will absorb much later in your potential scale. That means that the, your, your reaction will be slower because you need to give a higher, a larger work potential because before being able to actually split HF. Another way to go, or beyond the, what we have done now, it's, uh, so now as, as I described at the beginning, we have looked at the initial nucleation of the uh, SCI from SCI. So what happens at the molecular level at the, at the interface? 
we are not really looking at the evolution of the SCI. So what we have done now is limited to nanometer and picoseconds. We are not really looking at the formation of that, of, of a SCI layer. We can go on maybe using uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So if we train uh, our model to predict, to sort of in a, to, to run uh, cheaper calculations, then we can go instead of picosecond model to go to the nano, uh, nano uh, second scale. And then maybe we are even able to see the events while they happen. So for example, when we, we can see the uh, hydrogen splitting from HF or lithium fluoride forming a more complex uh, compounds, so for example, like a lithium fluoride rock salt. And this could be done uh, in a similar way, sorry, as we are doing with, uh, with water, using uh, uh, neural networks to produce uh, neural network classical potentials. And uh, we are doing this for water, uh, to what, for water on platinum. And the accuracy that we have now is around fi uh, 5 milli electron volt per atom on the energies and around 0 0.1 electron volt per angstrom on the forces. So it's quite good for water. We are not at this uh, scale yet for uh, uh, for the LP57, but uh, we hope to be to, to arrive here quite soon. So now my, my conclusions, I've shown you how to use uh, uh, density functional theory calculations to both discover new materials, but also to study in depth different uh, interface uh, with the goal of uh, making better batteries. Uh, there is, I show you a workflow designed to identify autonomous new materials with new potential candidates, and then how the interface plays a new, fo a new role and the fundamental role in the in the formation of the SCI layer. This can actually have a very large implications also in catalysis in general, because for the first time, the overpotential that are usually used for running the reactions, in this case, are used to create the right interface. So with the right interface means to have lithium pre-absorbed on the interface that will be a catalyzer for the reaction. Whereas usually an overpotential is used to as a, an activation energy. So it's it's quite different. Um, and then how to use artificial intelligence and neural network that can be used to speed up the calculations and maybe even extend their fidelity. So this is uh, what I've shown you here. We have uh, calculations that are in terms of uh, picoseconds, nanometer. Can we expand this and go for a nano nanometer scale or nanosecond scale and uh, uh, like hundreds of nanometer scale? And then how important is having a good synergy between experiments and simulation? in order to run, to, to get meaningful results from the simulations and try to explain uh, experiments with a high fidelity. Uh, the people I would like to acknowledge is uh, Felix Bölle, that is uh, one of my PhD students that is, uh, has been developing the, um, the workflow, uh, Nicolai Matthiessen and uh, Juan Margarecia Lastra that uh, prepare, uh, work on the reflective NAB, uh, Alexander Nies and Nestor Chatenet work on the magnesium and calcium ion batteries, and uh, from the University of Copenhagen, Jan Rosmeisel, uh, Dusan Strumchiknik, and Nenad Markovic from Argonne and the BMW group. And the last uh, uh, three groups work on the uh, lithium ion interface. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ivano. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I, I will, uh, maybe I will say a, a word here. So let's say, a, one of the biggest challenges we have in computational science applied to energy technologies and so on is the coupling of the workflows, the DFT workflows, this autonomous discovery of materials through DFT calculations, and this autonomous simulation of manufacturing process, right? So I think this is probably the, one of the things that we need to maybe put some effort in the future, how to close the loop between manufacturing, material synthesis, and for sure the electrochemistry going on. So and your, your presentation is, is, well, is really a really great overview of what is going on in that DFT, uh, DFT point of view, and uh, with the coupling with the autonomous uh, discovery techniques such as AI and so on. So again, thanks, thanks a lot for that. I think you are perfectly right. The fact that I mean, now we need to go beyond the uh, the, diff the 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 small realm and try to bridge them. It's something that, uh, as you just mentioned before, with the battery twenty thirty plus and other of these European projects, is something that is gonna hopefully happen quite soon. So, Mark, thank you, uh, Ivano, for this great presentation. I think we can move to the question part. Uh, maybe we. Uh, you can start with the first one from Diana Gallo. So as you can see on the lower left part of the question, you can click on the button Start Live Answer. 
and then you can uh, speak to uh, respond orally and the question will appear on the screen for every people in the audience. Uh, ah, okay, sorry. I was at the bottom of the, instead of the top. Yes. So, uh, um, well, there are so many, you were right, Alejandro. <laughs> yeah, that'd be, uh, it's very no, nice. Yes, I will do the same and reply to, uh, how can I, ah, start live, live answer. Okay. Uh, that's a, that's a very good point. So um, you asked me how the band gap uh, um, affects battery performances. So in this case, uh, I didn't. Uh, I, I mentioned the band gap because uh, uh, in my background, uh, I've been doing uh, materials discovery for solar cells. So the funnel that I show in in the figure in one of the first slides were actually taken for for light harvesting applications. So I think uh, uh, that probably will answer your question that you have a. You know, the band, in that case, the band gap was not used for a battery um, to, de to design a new battery material. But then, of course, you need to consider if you are looking at, uh, uh, I mean, uh, solid state electrolyte or something like that, you need to, to take into consideration what are the properties of the, of the cathode or of the, of the anode. Okay, so... Yeah, so I can I can see yeah uh, if you want to do high throughput calculations it's not first principle simulation bad idea any particular reason apart for accuracy to use DFT uh, I think DFT is one of it became one of the most common uh, codes to do this kind of uh, high throughput or uh, method sorry to use high throughput calculations and uh, uh, of course I mean you have a good accuracy but at the same time you have a, a good computational cost. So if you consider compared to like other chemical chemistry uh, methods that have uh, maybe a higher accuracy, but uh, they are also much more expensive or hard to fog method that could be cheaper, but not with the same accuracy. Uh, I think, I mean, it, it became popular. And then uh, from that point on, we start using DFT. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a great method because of, you know, it allows you to go, to go for uh, many, uh, like a good data set and in a, in a decent amount of time. Um, okay. Nice stream. Uh huh. Uh, I'm not actually really sure about uh, how efficient magnesium ion and calcium band batteries uh, compared to lithium ion battery in terms of uh, commercialization. I'm not aware of any calcium ion battery that is uh, even close to be commercialized. Uh, maybe Alejandro, you know a little bit more about this, uh, but uh, because it's more, it's closer to the, to the final products ra rather than the, on the material side. But uh, I think uh, that the, we are still, I mean, it, we are not super close to have uh, magnesium and ion batteries on the market. Okay, so more on the on the um, funnel uh, approach. Does the input structure need to be previously relaxed? So in this case, we take the structure from the ICSD database. So in principle, they are uh, they are structure that already known. What we do is usually uh, relaxing that as a first thing, and then uh, we do a different like we, we create a different uh, structure that are needed. But in principle. I mean, this was our approach to speed up the search, but in principle, you could also create the structure on the unrelaxed side, and then, of course, you relax them afterwards. But it's important, you know, to get good properties, you need to relax the structure, and you also need to be sure that you're relaxing the structure with the right potential, right? So use the exchange correlation function gives you a, a good estimation of the lattice parameter, and at the same time, it be a good energetics. Mm -hmm. Yes, perhaps um, Ivano, you can pick one more, and then the others yes. you can you can answer in. in yes, I, I will do that. Uh, 
So somebody asked me about the, the second part, is the word function just a descriptor or does it have any influence on uh, EC response? Uh, so for now, what we've been looking at was a word function descriptor, but it could be that uh, you know, the word function is also some sort of uh, uh, effects on the, on the rotation of the, of the molecules. This, uh, this we are not sure, we are some, is something that we are looking on. But for sure, it's a good descriptor for the uh, lithium, uh, lithium ion adsorption and uh, at, the, at the end of the, um, um, for the electrochemical response. I think my time is almost over, right, Alejandro? Yes, right. Ivano, thank you very much. Thank you for, very much for your nice presentation and uh, for sharing all this with us. And, uh, I, I, I think uh, people really enjoy your presentation. There are many questions <laughs> going there. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, Thank well, you, you for inviting me here. It was, uh, it's a, it was pleasure, a pleasure. So, please go ahead and uh, reply to people. I mean, you can reply in the chat. And uh, Yes, I will yeah. do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, you I know. should stop uh, sharing the screen now, right? <laughs> <laughs>